Good morning, Facebook Live, YouTube, however you may be watching us out there. Um, today is Sunday, June 7th, 2020. Uh, another rough week here in America. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I'm Pastor Jeff Elliott of New Horizons Fellowship. If you don't know that by now, we're here in New Haven, Indiana. I know that there are many of you who are watching who have never been here with us, but we are now uh, having services back in person. We have a large fellowship hall area. Everybody's spread out. We have windows open uh, so everybody can come and uh, maintain distance and so forth with sanitizer on that. You're more than welcome to worship with us. But if that never happens, I want to encourage you, uh, get in contact with me. I'd love to, to hear from you. Uh, I think some of you have uh, requested a Facebook friendship with me. Uh, don't be offended if I haven't answered that. Um, I, that's not a way I communicate. It's... Uh, if you really want to get in touch with me, use uh, email. In a descending order, here's the way I would do it. Email would be first. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all those sorts of things, um, but I'm not always every day able to respond to those. But you're more than welcome to put a comment in the section here. I encourage you to like and share this message. If it's, if it's something important to you uh, that you want to share with others, you're more than welcome to do that as well. You're as, as welcome as you are to join us in person. So, uh, again, I'd love to hear from you. Um, uh, like I said, it's been a rough week. Um, I'm, I'm a little, again, a little discouraged by social media and media. I'm probably going to step back a little bit from that uh, just because the, the tone, the bitterness, the envy, the ask the taking sides and making other people take sides has really become divisive. And I find it's not good for me emotionally in my heart. I really want to be doing about guided by what God wants me to do. So I would encourage you to do the same. Um, but like I said, this last week, people are going to do what they're going to do. So, uh, but I pray that God the Lord will minister to you today and encourage you somehow. There have been so many statements this week, people saying, this is where I stand on this issue. Uh, and it's kind of annoying to me that we need to do that. Aren't we, all supposedly on the site of right and good. Uh, and I think everyone would say that, um, but people disagree on what is right and good. So that's the issue. Um, but as far as myself and this church, the missionary church, we are opposed to evil and racism in any form. Um, I don't agree with the violence and looting. I understand that desperate people do desperate things sometimes. Um, I'm encouraged that our attention uh, and our Resolve and our resources have finally been gathered that seems to do something about this issue in America. Um, but I would encourage you that if you're going to engage in social media, do it with a spirit of goodwill. Don't assume the worst of somebody. Don't label people. Don't stir up bitterness and strife and anger and hatred and all the things that just seems to be doing so well. Um, and there's so much divisiveness. Um, but encourage people in goodwill and unity that we. We all want to solve this problem, and we want to do the right thing. So I want to encourage you with that. We're going to uh, start with a word of prayer this morning that kind of deals with that issue. We're going to ask God to intervene in this situation because uh, there's really spiritual battles going on out there as well. Uh, so I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we come to you this morning. I thank you for those who are watching. I pray that you are indeed going to speak to them this morning through your word and through the power of your spirit. Our hearts are broken again this week by more news of violence and hatred and just um, people at each other's throats about things that we probably agree on if we would just stop and listen. Lord, we know that this is more than that. It's a spiritual battle also. We would pray against the forces of evil and darkness uh, that are stirring people up uh, into violence. We would pray also against the other evils of poverty and, um, and hunger that still exist in our world and in our country and possibly in our, even in our own city today. We pray against the depression and darkness and the emotional struggles that people are, are facing due to this long isolation. And this is probably another factor in why we were having um, the violence like we are. Lord, we pray against all the things that Satan would use to divide his people that would lead us into places to harm each other, that would stir up our anger and emotions toward each other in, in wrong ways. Uh, we pray against anything that Satan would use to enslave and blind people uh, from the hope and the light that you offer. Lord, we stand for peace and justice equally. We know that you are a God of both. Uh, we have seen great wrongs, uh, and there have been times where we did nothing about it. 
we have watched and ignored as if we are uninvolved and not guilty. And by not seeking justice, as your prophet Micah encouraged us, we have allowed brutality and injustice to prosper and to continue. Now, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for those for whom we should have intervened. <clears throat> and then we ask you now for the means to aid those in their our brothers and sisters uh, in seeking an end to this to this evil in our society. Lord, we acknowledge that this goal will ultimately only be accomplished at your return. And until that day, we pray for the release of your Holy Spirit on this earth, that he would capture hearts and minds, returning and drawing people to you, convicting us of sin and injustice in our own lives, and, and just draw us closer to you. Lord, now as we open your word, may we hear your truth through the voice of your Spirit. We invite the Holy Spirit in this time to join us. We open your word. May you bless the reading and the hearing of it and use it to bring further fruit and growth toward your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. Well, good morning. Uh, we are starting, I'm starting a new series today. You're welcome to join me. If you have a Bible, uh, you're going to want to turn it to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, I'm going to uh, read uh, pretty much the whole chapter, uh, but also want to in encourage you. We're going to have some verses on the screen, so you won't have to be flipping back and forth, but you can find a Bible online if you don't have one. If you'd like one, we have uh, several here. We'd be glad to give you one. Let us know, and we'll get that to you the best way we can. Uh, but the series today, is, the series is called The Heart of a King. And it's going to focus on uh, Saul, King Saul, David, and Solomon, the first three kings of Israel before the kingdom was divided. Um, and to be real honest, I don't think we're going to get to Solomon in this calendar year of 2020. I think it'll be next year. Uh, in the fall, we'll be towards election and Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we'll do those sorts of things then. Um, but I want to introduce you to the context of where we are here in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, Israel has just come through a time period that was called the period of the judges. And in that, it was a system uh, of cycles would be the best word to describe it. Of um, uh, Israel would have an oppressor, people who would make them enslave them and force them into slavery. God would raise up a judge from one of the people who would militarily fight to overthrow their oppressors. Israel would continue that way for a while, and then they would begin to turn their hearts and minds uh, towards the other gods of surrounding nations, and they would God would bring in another oppressor, sometimes the Philistines, there's Ammonites and all kinds of ites in there that would do those sorts of things. But the judges can be described as every man did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, and as I began to, as I finished this series this week, I saw so many things that are so culturally appropriate for where we are today, and that was the first of them. Uh, when every man did what was right in his own eyes, and uh, God struggling uh, to have his people focus on his leadership and his his guidance. Um, but still in the period of the judges, um, the judges were more military than spiritual leaders. Uh, mostly uh, fought battles and led Israel into battle. And this period lasted about 300 to 500 years. There's some overlap, so it's tough to, to really narrow it down. Um, but that idea of the judges stands in contrast to the man who we're going to see today, Samuel, who is called the last judge. He was technically and officially a priest. He was, from all I've read, he was not a military leader at all. And I've never really understood why he was called the last judge, um, because what he did was so different from the other judges. He's really more of a transition between the judges into the time of the kings. We're going to see that today and next week. Um, and for the purpose of this series, we're going to focus on those three kings. And so keep in mind, that's who Samuel is. He's the last judge, but he's more of a transition person between judges and kings. So 1 Samuel chapter 8 says this, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges over Israel. His firstborn son name was Joel, and his second was Abijah. Um, now the judges themselves, as kind of points out here, were not direct descendants of a father. Or excuse me, they were. Like in, uh, no, they were not. Excuse me, I'm really confused. The judges were chosen, raised up by God, and they were not direct descendant like we will see with the kings. The king and then his son becomes king. The judges were not that way. So what Samuel's doing is here is he's appointing his sons as judges, which may be a little outside of what Israel's used to, uh, but then they're going to take that even a step further. So he has these two sons, verse 3, verse, verse Samuel 8. However, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned toward dishonest prophet took bribes, and perverted justice. Take note of the three ways that the Scripture says that these guys were corrupt. They took 
Den a dishonest prophet, and this, another version says they turned aside after gain. They took bribes, self-explanatory, and they perverted justice. Um, so it says, the first thing it tells us is that Samuel is old and the people are concerned. Now that Samuel has appointed his sons as judges, these are not good guys and we're concerned about this. Samuel was okay. He was following the Lord in righteousness and leading us in the right way. But now that his sons are going to take over, now that he's old and when he dies, we're going to be in trouble. So they're going to do something here in verse 4. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and went to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Therefore, appoint a king to judge us the same as all the other nations have. See, they've, they've cited there's a breakdown in the righteousness of the, in the purity of the temple. God had created Israel to be a distinct nation. I'm going to talk more about that in Leviticus 20. It says this. Uh, God's describing the nation of Israel. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from the nations to be mine. Um, so when the people come to Samuel and, and God hears them eventually, we'll see in a moment, they're asking to be like other nations. And God says, but you are to be my nation, a chosen nation. He, rose, he raised them up from the seed of Abraham. He created this nation, brought them to this land. And the people are crying out uh, for another leader. It's as if they're saying this isn't working. Or it's not going to work when Samuel dies. We need to try something else. And then, and so I began to wonder, what is the root of their request? What are they worried about? Um, but the crisis of corruption among Samuel's sons has led to an opportunity. Uh, possibly they are concerned about the moral qualities of Samuel's sons. And they don't measure up to Samuel's standards. But the problem really comes in is that they aren't asking for a king who's going to lead them righteously and morally to serve the Lord. They want one like the other nations have, right? You've probably, if you're a parent, you've probably heard your kids say that so-and-so was able to do that. And perhaps God even knows that, uh, and he had given permission earlier in Leviticus, probably come back to this next week, had given them permission to, to get to gather a king, but he's going to warn them like we see here in a moment. Um, but God probably knows that they want this striking figurehead to lead them into battle against their oppressors and their enemies. So look at verse 6 now. When they said, give us a king to judge us, Samuel considered their demand wrong, so he prayed to the Lord. Other versions say Samuel was displeased or he was crushed. Um, it's enough that your own children are not following in your ways, especially if you're pursuing God. Um, but now that the people have also recognized this and said to Samuel, your sons do not rule us like you do, uh, and when you die, we're in big trouble. So his feelings are hurt. He's their present leader. But it doesn't say that, uh, he responded to them right away with a yes or no. We're going to get a king or no, we're not going to get a king. He didn't chastise them or encourage them. He prayed first. It's what I encouraged um, on Thursday, encouraged our online audience to do. Um, but think what that prayer must have been like for Samuel um, when he's displeased by what the people are saying. And essentially he has to go to God and say, you're fired. Right? The people don't want you anymore. They want a king like the other nations have. So it not only broke Samuel's heart, it's got to break God's heart as well. Look at verse 7. But the Lord told him, Listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected you. They have rejected me as their king. They are doing the same thing to you that they have done to me since the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, abandoning me and worshiping other gods. Now, as I read that verse, I can just hear the the dejection in God's voice about uh, how they have rejected him again. And it must have broken God's heart along with Samuel's that the people desired this human figurehead instead of a longing for God to be their king. I want to read you a paragraph that um, I read from um, a devotional I'm reading this, this week. Um, it describes how the relationship between God and Israel. It says, from a certain standpoint, the existence of Israel is baffling. A small, nondescript nation, it was located among, along the most strategic highway of the ancient world, surrounded by larger, stronger, and more advanced nations. Yet these ancient superpowers, the Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. Now he's talking about uh, a larger portion of Israel's history than where we are here in 1 Samuel. Um, while all those entered and exited from the world stage, while Israel remained, Israel's existence within this arena proved incredibly challenging. But Israel nevertheless survived. Uh, and I thought of that even in the 20th century as the Jewish the Israel, Israelite nation came through the Holocaust. Uh, there have been many nations that have tried to overthrow and, 
and destroy the nation of Israel, and yet God's hand is still is still on that nation, preserving it and its people and their uh, message of hope for the world. So let me read you this verse. That this is what Moses says um, in the book of Deuteronomy about the nation of Israel and their relationship to God. He says, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon it? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? Moses is like, there's no other nation in the world that has the sovereign God who created it and is, and is guiding it. And what are you guys up? What are you guys trying to do in turning your backs? This is what Samuel shares that thousands of years later. Uh, as I said, this, this story is uh, in Numbers 14. This might have been the incident that Moses is referring to. Uh, at the time of Numbers, Israel has left Egypt. They're wandering in the wilderness. Uh, they've sent the 12 spies out. They've come back. Ten were bad and two were good, right? Um, and the spies report that the land is full of giants. And in Numbers 14, it says this. The whole community of Israel broke into loud cries and the people wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron and the whole community told them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. So this is number 14. This is before 1 Samuel chapter 8 has happened. And in that passage, Moses and Joshua and Aaron, they intercede with the people and they say, it's a, it's a good land. God has brought us here. Don't be afraid of the giants. The, their protection has been removed. Uh, but the people are ready. They're ready to stone Moses and Joshua and Aaron. And in verse 11 of chapter 14, as God steps in and says, And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? You can hear the heartbreak in God's, God's tone there. This nation that he has provided and protected for all these years is, a, is once again choosing someone else. So in 1 Samuel, which is not, only, not just the second, it's the, the, uh, another among many times that they have done this. So Samuel's inclination that the people want to be like other nations and reject God's rule is correct and it's affirmed by prayer. God says they've been doing this the whole time. Look at verse 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 8. God says to Samuel, listen to them, but solemnly warn them and tell them about the customary rights of the king who will reign over them. Um, and we might get into this a little bit more next week. Um, but they get an, God gives them another chance to reconsider. He says, you guys say you want a king, but here's what a king is going to do. He's going to give them another chance to choose. He says kings are not all they're cracked up to be. So in these verses 10 through 18, he gives a, a long list of the things that the kings are going to do. And I'm not going to read it for us so you can read that on your own. Let me summarize it for us. What is a king going to do? He's going to take your sons for his armies. And he's going to make them plow his fields. He's going to make them make weapons. He's going to take your daughters to cook and serve in his bakeries. He's going to take your best fields, your vineyards, and your orchards and give them to, to other people, and, and including his own servants. He's going to take a tenth of your grain. He's going to take your servants. He's going to take a tenth of your flocks. Basically, he's going to draft you to serve in his, in his service, and he's going to charge you taxes to do it. So Samuel lays it on pretty thick. I mean, he is really opposed to this idea of Israel getting a king. So what happens here in verse 19? The people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we must have a king over us. And again, they say, then we'll be like all the other nations. Our king will judge us, go out before us, and fight our battles. Wasn't that what God had been doing? Judging them and leading them and fighting their battles. There's so many miraculous stories in, in, the, in the book of Joshua of how God uh, uses his small nation of Israel to overthrow the surrounding nations. But the people are willing to accept taxation and being drafted into the king's service for the sake of being like all the other nations. They say we must have a king so that we can be like other nations and our king is going to judge us and he's going to fight our battles. And Samuel and, and the Lord certainly knew what the tone of people's request was. Verse 21, Samuel listened to all the people's words and then repeated them to the Lord. So there's this back and forth. The people come to Samuel. Samuel goes to the Lord. God says, tell him what a king's going to be like. Samuel goes and tell him what the king's going to be like. And then he goes back to the Lord and goes, and the Lord says, listen to them. The Lord told Samuel, verse 22, appoint a king for them. And that um, that brings us to the, to the words that came to mind when I was studying this passage. Uh, I didn't really know I was going to do so, uh, the, the 
heart of a king at the time, but I knew uh, there were so many passages in here that were speaking to me. I thought we need to do this as a series. Um, but today's message is called Give the People What They Want, because that's the phrase that came to mind as I read this passage about God's going to appease the people. And it really, the, the reason that phrase came to mind is a couple reasons. Not only is it here in 1 Samuel 8, uh, we see God telling Samuel, give the people what they want, let them have a king. Um, but there's a, a podcast that I listen to once in a while that one of the um, one of the guys on there uses this phrase, give the people what they want. And it's actually, I thought I should probably study the origins of that. It's from an OJ song, probably back in the 60s. And as I studied it, I recognized that um, uh, pr pr President Obama used it as a, I don't know if it's a steam song, but at least used it at some of his rallies. Uh, um, so it's kind of got a, you know, the Motown flavor to it, and the words are kind of, you can see why he would be able to use it for that. I'll send you the link with the notes if you're if you're going to receive those. Um, so that's the reason this phrase, give the people what they want, came to mind. And the, the last part of verse Samuel, verse chapter 8, verse 22, then Samuel told the men of Israel, each of you go back to your city. So I began to think about this idea of God giving the people what they want. And why would he do that even when it's not in their own best interest? And he knows what's ultimately going to result. Why would he do that? So I began to to think about that even more and realize that God's authority and his sovereignty are not compromised or diminished by any sort of earthly authority. Uh, and I'm sure I've instructed our congregation this every time we get to an election year, that it doesn't matter who's president, Jesus is king, and we're going to see that. Uh, I think I have a little graphic for that that we'll see in the future. Um, but God is not threatened by his own people's plea for a king. And we see it play out in, in Israel's history that depending on the heart of the king that they are under at the time, sometimes they serve the Lord and sometimes they turn away from him. And that, and that brings us to the title of the series that I've been talking about, The Heart of a King. And I want to, it's kind of an, an odd thing to introduce the title of the series after the title of this message, but I want you to see where this is going. Um, in Proverbs 21, chapter 1. It's chapter 21, verse 1. The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. So as we think about this idea of the heart of a king and why Israel would request a king and they're turning their back on God, we have to be reminded that God is a much higher judge than a king. He even controls the kings in Psalms 33. I think it says that as well. Um, but we'll, we'll dig into this more next week. But I thought the best way for me to conclude our time this morning would be reading a psalm which I don't normally do to conclude. Um, but there are these psalms that are called royal psalms. And they, they describe either an earthly king or a heavenly king, and sometimes both in the same passage. There's about a dozen of them. Uh, and Psalm chapter 2 is one of those. And I wanted to read that today because I thought it was, it's a good conclusion to this series where we've been, this message where we've been today, but also describes uh, the times that we live in. And I hope it would bring some encouragement uh, to you who are as um, discouraged by uh, what, we, what we've seen going on in the world and week around us. So I want to read this to us today. Keep, the, keep your current context in mind as we read this Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers conspire together against the Lord and his anointed one. Let's, and this is the king speaking. Let's tear off their chains and throw their ropes off of us. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord ridicules them. Then he speaks to them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter. You will shatter them like pottery. So now, kings, be wise. Receive instruction, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. Pay homage to the Son, or he will be angry. You will perish in your rebellion. For his anger may ignite at any moment. All who take refuge in him are happy. So those last few verses are the best way we can... We can conclude this today. Serve the Lord with reverence for all. Rejoice with trembling. Even though the kings of the earth have exalted themselves, even though uh, our country is in a position of anarchy and, <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, chaos today, and at least distraction and uh, disruption, even though our hearts are heavy and broken and mournful of the state that we find ourselves in, God is still on the throne and he is still king. 
And our instructions remain the same, to serve him with reverential awe and rejoice with trembling. All who take refuge in him are happy. I pray that that will be a note of encouragement to you today. I'll be back. If you're online, I'll be back this Tuesday on uh, Facebook Live. YouTube's usually a little later. It's usually at 9 o'clock, but it takes me a while to get the YouTube part up. Uh, but you're encouraged to join us. We've been exploring the more gentle fruits of the Spirit that I think are even more necessary in the times that we find ourselves in. But I want to pray for us today um, and ask that the Lord will be an encouragement to you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who have joined us. I pray that your Spirit has spoken to them. Pray that we can all acknowledge you as King over heaven and earth. Uh, as, the, as the song says, you are Lord of heaven and earth. originator of all creation, of all people, of all hearts and minds. Lord, give us wisdom and discernment. Help us to be people of peace, not people that seek to divide. And there is so much division going on in our country today. Lord, help us to be people that are willing to listen and dialogue and engage others in this necessary discussion in this time in our country. Help us to not uh, to realize that you love all people equally. Most of all, Lord, we want to acknowledge and serve you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We close this morning with Paul's words to Timothy. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless. Hope you have a great week.